Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Abigail, and I would like to welcome you to the Finding the Right Fit event and our last event of our college admission series. Um, thank you for everyone for coming, and thank you for all the speakers talking tonight. Um, I would also like to thank all the MCs who organized this event. Um, during this event, uh, the speakers will talk about their own universities and traits unique to them, such as student, the student environment, academics, and much more. We hope this will help you narrow down what calls you are most appealing to. Um, before we introduce the speakers, we have a short poll just to get to know who you are. Um, let me start it. Um, I'll just ask you a few questions, just your current grade, um, whether you're interested in going in state or out of state, and if you've attended any other events in this series. Uh, you guys can kind of see who's all in here and what interests or if you guys share any of the same interests. Um, okay, now I'm going to pass it off to Suhani to introduce all of our speakers for tonight. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Suhani, and I want to thank you all for coming to the event. Um, as Abigail said, I'll be introducing our speakers for tonight. Um, first up, we have Luis Pena. He is currently a junior at Grand Canyon University, majoring uh, in computer science with an emphasis in business entrepreneurship. He is a 2018 recipient of the SIS Full Tuition Scholarship. Luis is involved in several student leadership positions, such as being a resident assistant on campus and vice president of TEDx GCU. He is also a student worker within a department that oversees all private scholarships at GCU. Thank you, Suhani, for the introduction. So hello, I'm Luis. I go to GCU, Grand Canyon University. And if you don't know, GCU is a private Christian university. And there's a couple of things that makes GCU really unique. Um, its atmosphere is very positive. There's always, you know, people holding the door for you and saying hi, or random strangers going by. And it's such a, such a welcoming place. And there's a lot of really good events that actually welcome people. Uh, the first two weeks of school, we have welcome week. And there, there's so many events to, to get all the students together. And this is before school starts. So you have a good way to just meet friends before you start school. And especially if you're a freshman coming in and you don't know anybody, just going to these events and meeting people is such a great way to start the year and be transitioning into university, which is something that's really hard, especially when you don't know anybody. And throughout the semester, we actually have so many other cool events. We have Mr. GCU, which is like a huge talent show that everybody goes to. We have Lollapalooza, which is like Lollapalooza, where it's just a big music festival. We have casino night, silent disco. There's events happening all the time. And every university has events, but at GCU, they're really fun, at least from my experience. And at GCU, we actually have a pretty decent population. Um, some people think this is a small school, but we actually have about 20,000 on-ground students. And of course, there's a lot of commuters, 60% commuters, and then 40% actually live on campus. But wherever you go, you always see people walking by, you always see people in groups, so many people just hanging out and having fun. And you could you can make friends so easily around every corner. And that's what I love about it. And speaking about uh, people living on campus, I'm gonna touch briefly on the dorms. There's so many dorms at GCU. And if you know anybody that goes to GCU, one funny thing about it is that there's always construction going on. There's always something new being built. And even as I'm speaking right now, there's a new, um, a new apartment being built on GCU. And we have been building new um, dorms every year. So there's just so many new dorms being built that there's more people coming in. And it's, it's a great way to be involved, to live on campus and you know, be able to experience the, the full university experience. And there's so many clubs to be involved in and there's so many um, student-led organizations, whether it's um, academic and honor societies, career and professional clubs, welcoming clubs, cultural ministry, outreach government, fine arts. There's all kinds of clubs for everybody. And, you know, even if you don't feel the need to like be involved, at least being involved in a club that's specific to your major can be super beneficial. You get to meet people that you're going to take the same class with and you get to have these friends that you're going to be doing homework with. And it's so great. And I, I really love GCU for that. 
But the cool thing about GCU too, if there's not a club that you like, you actually have the opportunity to make your own club. And I did that. Um, my scholarship, the SIS scholarship that we mentioned earlier, um, we turned that into a club as well. We turned it into the SIS council. We went up to our student body government. We pitched our club and they give us funding for it. And all you need to do is bring a good idea, have it well planned out, and you're able to start your own club. So there's a lot of great student leadership um, opportunities like that. And one student leadership opportunity that I'm involved with is being an RA on campus. So being a resident assistant, you get to help out your residents, you get to help people move in, you get to help monitor things when the directors aren't around. And it's just a great way to be involved and build community. And there's such a great positive community on campus. And another community is um, sports. We have a good amount of sports. We have basketball, cross country, baseball, golf, soccer, tennis, you know, all the basic sports. And the cool thing about sport, sports here is that we have obviously our D1 sports, but we also have club sports and we also have intramural sports. So we have all kinds of levels of involvement. And for those of you who don't know much about intramural sports, it's basically um, you start your own little team on a phone app and you join with some friends and you're involved in sports. It's as easy as that. So it's just a really great way to be involved. And there's so many ways to get involved. It's kind of hard to not be involved. So that's another thing I really love about the community here. But uh, a typical day on campus is, um, it, it varies for people. Me, I'm really involved. So I have one club and then I have another uh, club and then I have classes and I have my RA position and then I have my, my job. So my, 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 my hours are all over the place. But for a normal student, you know, they, they can still have a great time. Even if you're not someone who really wants to be involved, you can still have a great time just hanging out with your friends, uh, studying. There's so many places to study here on campus, whether you want to study at the library or at our coffee shops. We have GCBC, which is a coffee shop where everybody gets to hang out. And there's, there's a lot of different places. There's um, study rooms in dorms, and there's also study rooms in the college buildings. So there's a lot of places where you could just be out and about and you could also be really productive while doing it. So there, there's a lot of great opportunities there. We also have study abroad opportunities and I don't know much about that, but I do know some people that took those opportunities and they really enjoyed it. So if that's something that you're interested in, we do offer that here at GCU. And then besides um, being able to study at various places, every um, dorm has their own gym facility. So if that's something that is important to you, it's, it's everywhere. Every, every dorm has their own gym. So you can literally just walk downstairs and boom, there's a gym, you can work out. And around every corner, there's also a lot of places to eat. We have all the, all the main things like Panda, Taco Bell. We have, um, what, what else do we have? We have a pizza place. We have, there's so many places I can't remember them guys, but whatever, whatever satisfies your hunger, we have it. Don't worry at all. And, you know, like, like I said, my, my main takeaways and my main things uh, when talking about GCU is that there's such a welcoming community and it's so positive. You could just feel the strong sense of spirit in the air. And there, there's so many people that are just willing to help out. And there's, there's a lot of great resources here on campus as well, whether it be academic resources or counseling resources or anything in between. There's such a strong community for that as well. I personally um, struggled a bit with classes. So I went to our academic centers to get some tutoring. And there's, there's a lot of professors in there. There's student workers in there. And there's people that are in the same position as you. There's students in there as well. So there's, there's everybody in there and they're all willing to help. So it's such a great community and I would highly recommend it. But I think that's about, um, everything I have to say on GCU. Thank you so much, Luis. Uh, next we have Jennifer, who is a first-generation Latina student who was born and raised in Bullhead City, Arizona. Uh, she is a recent graduate from Mojave Community College with an associate in elementary education. She is currently in her first semester at ASU as a transfer student. She is also a member of the Advise AC virtual team program that guides students with their post-secondary education endeavors and process. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jenny and um, thank you for the introduction. Introduction, you did amazing. Um, so um, since everything went virtual, um, my first semester at ASU has a bit 
has been a little bit different. <laughs> um, so today I'm gonna talk about my experience at a community college because um, it was really, uh, it holds a big moment in my life. Um, so during senior year, if I'm gonna go back into my memories. Um, while I was um, a senior, I had, um, so financial, um, financial, financial was definitely a worry for me. Um, I knew that I couldn't afford a four-year university, so I knew that I had to create a plan where I would be able to secede and to attain a post-secondary degree. Um, while the, I was deciding whether to go to um, a university or community college, I was conflicted. Um, there was a lot of pressure and a lot of encouragement for post-secondary uh, degree at a university and not so much at a community college. Um, so one thing I, I want to say is that I hear you and I understand you. I was there. Um, I felt that I was doing a mistake by going into community college. I felt that I was um, considered less as a student of like it wasn't um, something to be proud of. Um, but boy, was I wrong. Um, it is something to be proud of no matter where you're going. Um, and it could be a community college, it can be a trade school, it can be a vocational school. It doesn't necessarily have to be a university. Why, while I do applaud those who are given the opportunity to attend a university, um, in some cases, we also have to acknowledge that it's not the case for everyone and that's okay. Uh, so thankfully, I um, decided to um, attend my community college that was nearby. I am literally 20 minutes away, so the drive is good. <laughs> um, and the good thing about staying in my community, so I'm born and raised um, in Bowhead, so everyone knows who I am, so I didn't have to um, make new friends. I didn't have to um, make a new place like seem like home. It was already home to me. Everyone was super friendly. Um, I just felt that, um, at peace for my decision. Um, but it took a lot. It took a lot for me to say, okay, I'm proud of, of, of going to a community college. And I know one thing as working as an AmeriCorps member, for Advise AC, I have met a lot of students who will share that they're discouraged to go to community college because one, it's expected out of them, or two, they're pressured um, because of financial um, issues and circumstances. Um, but one thing I do want to say is that um, no matter, um, it, it, the pressure will always be there. Um, from your peers of like they're going to university and your first year is going to be the hardest. Um, you're going to see them go to college parties. You're going to see them join sororities. You're going to see them join um, so many things that at a community college, depending on what college you go. So mine is very small. We don't even have sorority groups. We don't have dorms. We're a very small population. We're like maybe two to three thousand in total for a very small community um so it, it all depends but one thing i want to say is that in the long run what truly matters is that you're financially secured in your decision of post-secondary and that you're well um you're well prepared uh, to make that decision of going to college and say i have a financial plan i'm, I'm going to get that degree because um, both community college or university were working for the same goal, and that is to get a degree. Um, so um, definitely don't be discouraged, go to community college. Um, but while I was at community college, I was um, very actively involved. I was president of Student Activities Council, so that's a student life um, um, club in at my community college. And we um, are, activities were very community based. So we had um, a lot of events where not only were students amongst each other from the community community um, engaging with one another, but we were getting exposed to um, business owners from our community. We were um, we were building networks within our community. So that is the neat part to uh, attending community 
uh, college as well is that you're building your network between, uh, in your community. So they're becoming, you're becoming a familiar face so that when you um, have your degree, you, they already know that, you know, they're waiting for the day that you graduate so that you can get a job. So um, that is one of the things too, that you become a familiar face in your community if you haven't already. Um, everyone's like family, and you probably have heard this a while, like, oh, you know, we treat everyone as family because we're so small, but it's the truth. <laughs> um, I can honestly, honestly say that, um, well, being an advisor AZ member, I was able to work uh, at my old Mojave um, high school um, that I graduated from, and I was helping students who I grew up with, and so I became someone that they trusted, and um, and it only takes one person to really um, change your perspective of a community college to make a difference. Um, so one thing I want to say is that um, the stigma behind community colleges needs to end. Um, you know, it is an option and it's something that you should be proud of. And um, even though there's not a lot of activities, you have to make the best out of it. You need to um, get yourself out there, join clubs, um, get, um, you know, go out, do hiking activities, or um, like Luis was saying, create your own um, club at your college. Um, that This is your opportunity to shine. Um, don't let anything hold you back. Um, and just make those two years or even four years the best that you can. And then once you become to that university level, tell yourself, I did it. I finally did it and be proud of it, you know. One thing is that, um, you know, when I say, oh, I'm a transfer student, I've gotten to the point where I'm like, yeah, I'm a transfer student. So, you know, your uh, focus and your um, emotions and ideas towards community college will change throughout the years. And I'm telling you now, uh, even if you do decide to go to university or community college, you're gonna be proud anyway. And then so far, that's pretty much what I have to say for community college. Um, and I just appreciate you guys having me here. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, next we have Alexis, who is a first year student at the University of Chicago studying history while pursuing pre-med. She's involved in multiple initiatives to bring science education to youth in neighborhood schools and is part of an outreach program to connect undeserved populations with quality academic tutoring. A National Merit Scholar and Junior Achievement 18 Under 18 Award winner, Alexis attended Sunny Slope High School in Phoenix, where she was president of speech and debate for three years. She was also on the Teen Advisory Board of the Arizona Science Center and part of the Teen Leadership Team as a local nonprofit Swift Youth Foundation. She's passionate about science and more importantly, science education. Hi, thank you, Sahani. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, hopefully everyone can see that. I can move this. So um, I'm a college freshman, so I went through the college application process really recently um, during COVID-19. And I know that for me, the uh, most helpful part of the whole college admissions process was people walking me through their thought process. And so when it comes to choosing the right fit for university or community college or any kind of post-secondary education, um, I wanted to walk you through my personal experience. So flashback to June of 2020 when college decisions came out. Um, and these were the schools that I was looking at. Um, and yet we don't have the time to get into it, but I was essentially able to narrow it down to just University of Chicago and Duke University. Um, so looking at those two schools in their own respects, um, the key differences that stood out to me were that the University of Chicago was a very urban environment. So Chicago is the quintessential big city. Um, it does have division three sports, and that was a little bit of a negative for me. Um, and it pretty uniquely has a quarter system. So the school year is broken up into four quarters, autumn, winter, spring, and summer. And so that means that every class that would typically be a semester long class is now done in 10 weeks. Um, so you can take a greater quantity of classes. Uh, comparatively, Duke University was a suburban environment in Durham, North Carolina. 
it has really strong Division I sports. I'm sure you've heard of Duke basketball. And it had the more typical semester system. So the deciding factors for me, um, I really like the quarter system at the University of Chicago because I'm trying to graduate in three years. And so doing that plus pursuing pre-med and being a history major means that I really liked the extra space of having more classes that I could take. Um, I liked the big city. I grew up in Phoenix, um, so I'm used to a bigger city, but it's a pretty different experience, um, which I can attest after living here for a couple of uh, months. Um, it's a little bit silly, but I really um, connected with the advertising materials at the University of Chicago. Um, they made me laugh, which, you know, you, uh, most, of, most of you guys have probably received some, if any at all. Um, and they're not really the most funny. Uh, so the fact that the University of Chicago made me smile was definitely a plus. I'd also grown up in Phoenix, um, which has a very, you know, unique architecture style. So I was a little bit entranced by the Gothic campus. Um, and the essays were very unique. So I ended up writing an essay on um, from the first person perspective of a banana as weird as that sounds. Um, and just the fact that that was a part of the really tough college application time um, kind of warmed my heart to the university. I was a little bit warned off because of um, the neighborhood. So it's in a relatively affluent neighborhood within Chicago's South Side. And unfortunately, um, there is a lot of crime around the neighbor around the university. Um, so that was a little bit nerve wracking. Um, it also doesn't have a super big like sports culture, which I was a bit bummed about. I wanted to do, you know, the big university sports thing. Um, and then it has an unfortunate reputation of quote unquote, where fun goes to die, just because the classes are really rigorous. Um, so I'd heard that and I didn't know too many students here. So that was a little bit worrisome. Um, and then comparatively to Duke, I really liked the school spirit that they exhibited there. I knew a couple people that went there. They enjoyed the school a lot. Um, Division one sports, but it really came down like the biggest deciding factor for me was that Duke did not have a walkable campus. So I watched a couple YouTube videos because I had never visited either of these schools. So I was, you know, going off fully of what the internet had to offer me. And I saw that people had to take shuttles and um, like drive themselves to class. And that really struck me a little bit as it just not being as much of a cohesive experience. Um, so that was probably my biggest deciding factor. So I did pick the university. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about my school. So um, it's quite actually the most gorgeous thing I've ever seen. Um, I was entranced by the seasons because I grew up in Arizona. We didn't really have trees or changing leaves. Um, so this, these are just some pictures from around the university that I took in my first couple days. Um, you know, the leaves were changing and I was entranced. Um, and then just about a couple traditions that I really enjoyed. So the University of Chicago made a big deal of telling everyone about these traditions. So the first is Dollar Shakes Wednesdays. Um, so essentially you just go to a building on the quad and you pay a dollar and you get like a milkshake. Um, and my friends and I like to joke that they're worth a dollar, um, probably not much more. But it's just a really fun experience to go with your friends um, and pick up a comparatively crappy milkshake. Um, another really fun tradition is Kuvia. It has a longer Norwegian name. Um, I'm afraid I'd butcher it if I pronounced it. Maybe Kuvia's Nurk? I'm not sure. But it's essentially a week-long winter festival that's um, centered around being outside and exercising in the coldest months of the year. Um, all I know is that it ends with the polar bear run where you run to Lake Michigan. Um, I'll let you guys know if I end up participating in that. Um, we'll see. It might be too cold. And then the final thing um, is actually just really interesting about the university. It's the host of the longest running and largest scavenger hunt in the world. So every year we have scav where you're grouped into teams based off of the people that you live with in your dorms. And you go looking for some really crazy items um, that range from everything like a giant pair of googly eyes to a nuclear reactor. 
Um, and funny story, you can choose to believe it if you if you want. Um, but I was told that university students actually built their own nuclear reactor and they had the government had to come take it away. I don't know if I buy it, but it's a fun story to tell anyways. Um, so these are just some pretty cool traditions. Um, Dollar Shakes hasn't been affected by COVID. I'm not sure yet about Kuvia. It'll probably have to be um, altered. And they did host a miniature scav hunt for like incoming freshmen all online. So I know that it is possible to transition that. Um, just getting to dorms. So there are only 1600 undergraduate students at the University of Chicago. There's a mandatory live on campus for your first two years. So they have to have enough dorms to accommodate um, all the first and second year students. So this is my dorm. It's called Campus North. It's on the north edge of campus. Um, and it's grouped into three buildings. Um, yeah, some other dorms. I'll just flip through them pretty quickly. Um, Max P. This one has a lot of like suites and it also has an underground tunnel to the library. Uh, this is Woodlawn. It's brand new, opened this year, um, but they don't have closets. They just have cupboards. Um, kind of a weird fact. A uh, couple more. This is I House. Snell Hitchcock. This is right on the quad. I kind of wanted this one. Um, South, just a couple different dorms. Okay. And then Probably one of the coolest things about the University of Chicago is they pulled a Hogwarts and they grouped you all into houses uh, when you first get to campus. And so I'm part of Boyer House. It's actually named after our dean. Um, and the house system is really cool because it's who you live with for your time on campus. And, you know, the relationship extends even when you don't live on campus. So you're grouped in, in your giant dorm, so in Campus North. Um, and you're grouped into like a segment, like a pod, and that's your house. And it's connected by the middle picture here by like a central gathering area. Um, it looks a little sad because of COVID, um, but normally it would be popping. Um, and so that's a really great com like communal friendship opportunity um, right when you get on campus. So some of my closest friends are in my house and that's just the typical walk down the hall, knock on their door, get breakfast with them. Um, no one really wants to see the bathrooms, but this is just to prove that not all dorm bathrooms are gross. Um, these are very nice, very nice bathrooms. Um, and then some of my favorite study spots on campus are the libraries. Um, so the one on the left is called Mansueto. We affectionately call it the egg. I guess it looks like an egg. You can make that assumption yourself. Um, and fun fact, it was actually featured in the Divergent movie um, as like the erudite headquarters if you follow that fun fact um but it's a really awesome place to study just because the light filters in through the windows um and the one on the right is my absolute favorite place on campus it's called harper memorial library and it's not actually a library in that it doesn't have books but it is a study space um and that's just it's just gorgeous you can sit there and the huge ceilings the stained glass windows um, beautiful in the afternoon light. So just some recommendations during COVID. Um, I was in your guys' position last year in that when college decisions came out, the COVID-19 pandemic was already underway. And so I had to make all of my decisions, um, you know, chose my right fit based off of the resources that I found online. Um, and the single most important piece of advice that I can give is to watch YouTube videos. I probably watched hours and hours of YouTube videos you know, from students that are making silly little daily vlogs that, you know, reveal insights about campus life to what the actual school is producing themselves. It just lets you get a lot, um, a better feel for it. Um, on Instagram, that one's definitely a big one for me. I followed as many University of Chicago accounts that I could. Um, and during the college application process, I followed all the schools that I was applying to, just so that you can start to get a feel for things. Um, go on Google Maps and go for a walk around campus. As someone who wasn't able to tour, this was, you know, the whole process felt pretty removed until I, you know, dropped my person in and started walking around the University of Chicago. Um, it just helps you feel a little bit more like you're actually there. Um, actually read the materials they send. Uh, UChicago is a very communicative school in that they probably sent a billion pieces of paper to my, to my house. Um, but when I read them, I started to get a 
a better sense for what the students were like, for what the atmosphere would be like, and um, whether or not I would find my tribe. And so when it came down to making a decision, I had everything laid out in front of me and I was making um, an informed decision. This one's silly, but go on TikTok and see what the students are posting. Um, speaking from experience, the University of Chicago students are probably posting about how difficult the classes are, which is fair, um, but they're also probably showing off the campus because it's gorgeous. Um, and then finally, try not to put too much stock into reputations. You know, um, you know, the other speakers have spoken about like their schools and how exceptional they are. And that's something that is not well communicated versus a, a, like via reputation. So try and put a lot more stock into what students are saying versus what other people are saying. Um, and yeah, that's everything for me. But COVID-19 doesn't have to make the college application or decision process too difficult. You can make an informed decision. Thank you so much, Alexis. Um, now, next we have Ms. Linda Clune from Allegheny College. After earning a BS degree in economics at Allegheny, admissions has been Ms. Clune's career of choice for 34 years. She is a member of NACAC, which stands for the National Association for College Admission Counseling. It is an organization of more than 13,000 professionals from around the world dedicated to serving students transitioning from secondary to post-secondary education. She is also a member of PACAC, which is the Pennsylvania Association for College Admissions Counseling. Hi everyone. Hi, I'm Linda Clune and I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I kind of took a different approach since I'm not a student or not a recent graduate, but um, the one thing that I really love about my job um, of being an admissions counselor is that um, is that really I can connect with students and really counsel them through the process, right? I really see that part of my job as an admissions counselor is yes, to market the college, um, and um, but the bigger the bigger part is to really um, have those conversations with each of the individual students that I meet to be able to um, you know best counsel them and best tell them a little bit more about um, Allegheny or um, other places that they might want to um, also consider in the sense of maybe they might not be a great fit. Everyone's not a great fit for the school that I work for, right? Um, but, you know, when we're, when we're talking about um, a liberal arts and science college. Allegheny College is a liberal arts and science college. Um, and um, so tonight I'm, I'm talking a little bit more about um, those smaller, medium-sized schools. Um, that are typically located in a um, an environment that's um, less re um, more removed from an urban setting, um, and there's always a lot of myths and uh, misconceptions sometimes that come along with thinking um, about going to a small school. Um, one of the panelists talked about you know the stigma of going to a community college, and I think that there's so much out there that I think you really just have to you know, really think about what's best for you. And so when you're thinking about the features and what's driving your, your conversation about where you might land, um, and, you know, size is one of those, um, don't think about what the best size for your friend might be or where your friend's having um, a really great experience. You really have to, I think, um, think about, um, you know, how you, how you learn best and what do you value. And when I think about some of the aspects to consider um, in finding your right size school, these are some of them. Um, and of course, um, you know, if you're looking through these, I'm not going to read them all through, but if you're looking through these, um, you know, um, when I go to the next slide, I kind of put in green those that might better align with a small to medium sized college versus a large college. Um, that would be um, in red, but um, but you could be a you know you could be someone that's a leader um, that still might end up at a large place, but it will make um, you will have to have more advocacy to make that um, that possible, especially early on in your in your college career. 
Um, so I think um, a lot about, um, you know, this is always where I start with the conversation with students. How do you best learn? Um, and what do you value the most? Um, if you are a student, say, for instance, that you really value and learn best from class discussion, and you currently go to a small school, and you think going to a large school is, um, you know, because that's where everyone's talking about going, um, that might not be your best fit. Um, if you really love the class discussion and you like, um, you know, learning from your peers and what they're thinking about, um, as well as the faculty member. Also having those faculty um, connections is really important. And so you might just land better at a small, medium-sized place than having you um, realize your best self at a large place. Again, most a lot of the students can um, be very happy in both situations, but I always think when I'm thinking about counseling a student to finding their best fit, it's kind of thinking about what will enable them to grow the best um, into who they should be becoming. Um, and so characteristics of a smaller, medium-sized, um, you know, liberal arts and science college um, are what's on the screen right now. Smaller size, um, usually in a town location. Um, focus is really on the undergraduate education um, scenario. There isn't um, competition um, with um, graduate graduate students, um, you know, for the opportunities or for the or the facilities. Um, also, you're not competing for faculty member time, um, typically because, um, you know, you're taught by full faculty members um, at an all undergraduate education. Um, we don't have GAs teaching you. And so if you really value that faculty member teaching advising time, then, um, then you really might consider um, an undergraduate institution, um, and also um, increased opportunity for leadership engagement. I said, you know, are you a leader? Do you want to be engaged? It's really easy to be engaged in a small um, community-oriented, more community-oriented um, place. Um, also, you, uh, you uh, typically apply to the college and not to a narrowly defined program or university within a college. Um, so, or a college within a university. So you're not applying to the College of Engineering or the, you know, having to decide the College of Liberal Arts or the College of Performing Arts. Um, you're basically applying to the college and then finding out your pathway as you go through um, your interdisciplinary curriculum, taking classes, figuring out what's best for you. Um, and so we're not really preparing you for a narrowly focused job. Um, I think one of the statistics that I saw very recently um, is that you are, um, everyone will have at least three to seven, and that might even be, that might even be a low average now, but three to seven different careers in your lifetime. So what we're trying to do is um, have you develop a very diverse skill set. Um, so that you can be successful for a lifetime of careers. Um, and we all do this in a very different way. And I have kind of the Allegheny by the numbers slide. Everyone kind of talked a little bit more individually about their institutions tonight. And we all vary a lot, but, um, you know, Allegheny, we're located in the northwest corner of Pennsylvania, um, very close to Erie, actually. So um, we're about 90 miles north of Pittsburgh, 90 miles east of Cleveland. Um, and we are located in uh, Meadville, Pennsylvania, which is a large town, small city. And many liberal arts and science and small colleges are are located in more remote places and less urban. Um, we have 1,800 students, um, all undergraduate students at our institution, and they actually come from 48, um, 48 different states in seven different countries. And I think that's where sometimes the myth is that you, um, you know, if you go to a small school, you'll, you'll have limited opportunities and you'll meet limited number of people that are different from you. And I think one of the things that's really great about, um, about Allegheny is that we, you really will learn from the diversity around you. And when I think about diversity, we think of, of course, geographic diversity with the 48 states and 70 different countries, but we also think about socioeconomic diversity. Um, 
we think about, you know, we have usually in our first year class, we have anywhere um, between 27 um, and 33% um, that are first generation students. And we do have a, an organization actually that um, focuses on um, first generation students as well as first generation faculty being um, very wonderful mentors for them. Um, we also, um, you know, so, so you may definitely be able to go to a school that has larger numbers of people in diverse um, populations, but I believe that a community um, like Allegheny where 100% of the students are residential, we all live on campus, students all live on campus, they're kind of mixing every day, developing those communities, and it really um, is hard. It's really hard to, um, one, remain anonymous, and it's very hard to um, not really extend yourself and learn more about yourself and also about other people. So um, some students, um, you know, don't have, don't go to school um, with um, a lot of diversity in their high school. They might go to a large high school, you know. So, so it's also one of those things that when you come to Allegheny, we want you to extend yourself and be in small class situations that average class size is 18 per um, 18 in Allegheny. Our typical first year class is only about um, 30 students except for larger science classes that then will break down into lab classes of about 20, 25. So um, we're always wanting you to um, interact and learn from the people around you. Uh, people that have, you know, come from similar backgrounds and also people that are very different. Um, 11 to one student faculty ratio. And um, uh, so you will have a lot of um, conversations with faculty and know them very well. Again, you will be taught by full faculty members um, at most of these small, medium-sized liberal arts um, institutions, um, especially those that are undergraduate only. Um, I loved um, when a previous um, panelist indicated, don't look at all the rankings. Um, and, um, and we do include some of those on our um, about slide, but two of the, two of the really um, uh, great rankings, I think um, really most highlight what the culture is at a place like Allegheny in a small place is that um, we were indicated for um, two years in a row as one of the top 20 places for um, to get a great undergraduate um, uh, undergraduate teaching, best for undergraduate teaching. And that means that faculty, you know, faculty really care about you. That is their number one thing. They are doing, um, they are doing research in order to make them better teachers. And they're pulling all the students from their classrooms um, into that research when they receive those grants. And that's gonna be you as an undergraduate student. And you're gonna hit the ground running right um, in your first year with, with um, ability to do those things. Um, one of my other favorite rankings and thinking about what happens with our size and how it helps our culture and growth um, as um, students, is um, we actually were recently um, recently um, indicated as a, or we reached climate neutrality. And so that was a goal about 11 years ago. And we did that as a community, which we really take a lot of community pride in. Um, another thing that um, is really greatly, um, is a, a full culture of our community is service. Um, you know, about 85% of our students do some type of service on campus, and some of those are also some of our favorite traditions, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but before I move on, um, um, Colleges That Change Lives, it's going to be a resource that I will um, really ask you if you're um, looking. I saw on the poll that um, some students are thinking about going out of state, um, and of course some will think about going um, to smaller um, institutions. All of the Colleges That Change Lives, um, Schools are smaller um, and uh, most are liberal arts and science colleges. Um, and really it's the transformative experience so um, that they're after. The mission is to transform you as a person throughout your four years. We don't want you to be the same person as you, as you were when you came into um, to our institutions. And um, when we talked about interdisciplinary, um, uh, you know, everyone, talked a little bit about what their first year looked like and whatever. And when we talk about interdisciplinary um, thought process, Ellie Gainey does this in a very unique way. Um, we, um, we have um, 
a requirement that all of our students have to have a major and have to have a minor and they have to be in two different disciplines. And so really from the start, we want you to start exploring your interests, ones that you already have in high school, but we don't expect you as a 17 year old, 18 year old to know exactly what you want to do um, and exactly every course that you want to take. And so what we want to do is expose you to the things that others talked about our study abroad for a semester or experiential learning study abroad for three weeks that you might go to Turkey or Greece. Um, through um, a May or June um, three-week study tour um, with faculty members um, so that you can discover more about yourself, how to apply the things that you're learning inside the classroom um, as you're going abroad, doing an internship. Um, and we really want our students to be connected to those things right away um, as a first year, as a first year student um, or the summer after, um, after your first year. Um, and uh, one of the things that we want you to do is learn how to solve problems from different perspectives. As we've seen with the pandemic, um, think the world doesn't stay the same. And so you really need to have those skills and those thought processes that you're able to attack world problems from, from many different ways. Again, going back to the pandemic, um, you know, um, people that, um, you know, studied pandemics, yes, it is, a, it is a global health crisis, a public health crisis, but it's also an economic crisis. It's also a mental health. Um, so students that are studying psychology and pandemics and you know, um, psychology and global health studies, that's a perfect um, way to understand better um, you know, so many aspects of, of what you might face in the future. Um, and uh, you know, and so I talked about um, the undergraduate research a little bit, study abroad, internship, service. Um, you know, we want you to connect to those opportunities in faculty because you will know them. Um, they will also help your pathways um, in your in your careers. Um, all of our students also do research. Um, a lot of fun things too um, on our campus, and one of the focuses um, was, of course, that you know, with 100% living on campus, our students are here. Um, with 48 student, 48 states represented, students are not going um, home on the weekends. They are here, um, and um, we have 120 clubs and organizations on our campus, and they really are affinity groups. Um, uh, we do have uh, Division Three athletics um, that about 30% of our, um, our students are involved in. We have performing arts um, uh, areas within the music or theater. And one of the great things about being at a school like our size is that there aren't a lot of lines drawn, um, hard lines drawn between what you are able to do. You can be a biology major here and a business minor and also be in a dance um, dance um, club, um, Orcasis, which is really one of the photos here is one of, um, it's actually one of our, um, our biggest draws um, of our student body. Um, it's the, it's the, the most well attended thing that any of our students do both in the fall and the spring semester. Our Art Doors Club, um, we're located in a wonderful um, picturesque um, area that you can do a lot of nature things. Um, so our Outdoors Club is one of our most popular um, um, student clubs and organizations. Um, but many times you can do things that you didn't even think about um, previously. Um, and so I think that that's a really important underscore. A lot of students, domestic students, are involved in our um, international club um, as well and um, in our affinity groups as well. So I think that that's a big thing that's for all. Most of our students are involved in at least three to five different things um, on our campus um, also. Um, and I think, you know, just um, really to, uh, you know, sum up, um, you know, I didn't talk about some of our traditions and things, but um, before I talk about the remember to, I would say, you know, some of our traditions are, of course, how do you get involved? You go to an involvement fair, one of the first 10 days that you're on campus and can start, con you know, connecting so that those connections and relationships will lead to opportunities either 
um, in the uh, student organization realm or something that you will do in an academic situation. Um, Wing Fest is a big thing. Um, we have um, our Gator um, activity programming on board that does um, programming on Fridays and Saturday nights. Um, and uh, even during COVID, we had a lot of things going on on campus. We um, were successful in having students here um, all semester um, and uh, looked a little different, but they did um, their very best to uh, make sure that there was still some interaction there as well. Um, so really remember, as you're looking, we um, on this side of the desk, um, as admissions counselors, we want to get to know you. Much like Alexis said, take advantage of our opportunities. Um, we want to get to know you. We want to get to know, um, you know, how we can connect you to people within our community. Um, do your homework, engage, um, you know, take, take ownership of your process, most definitely. All the tips that she gave were so great. Um, be open-minded as well. Um, I saw that most of you are juniors. As you're going through your junior year and your senior year, things are going to change. You're going you're gonna to evolve as a person. So allow yourself to, um, as you're doing your research and as you're evolving um, over the next two years, allow you to also you know, change your thought process on um, what might be the best fit for you. And lastly, I want to say just relax. Um, relax and try to have fun and learn more about yourself as you're going through the process. 80% of colleges admit more than 50% of their applicants. And that's a big thing. You are going to find your place. Um, and, uh, you know, we just hope it's the right fit for you, where you can flourish as a, as a learner and also as a person. Um, any additional questions, please feel free to reach out and, um, you know, best of luck with finding your right fit and, uh, and everyone's here to, to help you from your, um, your teen organization, as well as those who've been through the process. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Clune. Uh -huh. Um, now we, um, I will be handing it over to Tate, who will be leading the Q&A session. Hello guys, my name is Tate Peterson and yeah, I'll be leading the Q&A section. So if you guys have any questions for any of the colleges we have here today, go ahead and ask them and I will forward your question on to them. So Tate, I think we had some questions that we had generated, which is are in the production schedule. Do you have that up? Uh, no, but I can pull it up really quick. So I have one question um, for um, those of you that are in school or uh, recently graduated from school. Um, you know, what, what was the, I guess, the deciding factor? I know Alexis went into a lot talking about the deciding factors as far as what, you know, determining her choice to go to Chicago. But Jenny and Luis, what were your all's determining factors? Um, for, you know, choosing a Mojave Community College and a Grand Canyon? For me, I would say it came down to, um, uh, I'm DACA, so for me, finances was always an issue. So it was definitely finances. And above finances, it was um, opportunities, not only opportunities to attend, you know, more, more classes and be more successful, but the opportunity to be involved and get, you know, something something more than simply education out of it. The ability to network, the ability to get mm -hmm. to new people, grow and personal self-development as well. And I just saw so much, um, so many people um, just be expressive with themselves. So many people grow in their faith, grow in their, in their love of their work. And to me that, that meant everything. Um, I'm, I'm someone who's very family oriented. So seeing how like the community was really truly a big family to me, that's mm -hmm. what stood out, and that was my deciding factor, and I knew I made the right choice. 
Thank you. Yes, um, similar to Lise, I'm also very family oriented and it, um, I knew that I couldn't be away from our family a lot. Um, I actually get homesick a lot when they're away or I'm away. So I knew I just wouldn't have the greatest time by myself in a new um, place. Um, definitely financial was another reason why I decided right. to do community college as well. Um, but another factor to my decision was really giving back to my community. Um, one of my hopes and desire is to teach in my community that I, um, that I was born and raised so that I can give back and become a familiar face for my community. Um, I talk about my community a lot, but they really, um, we are so small that we all love and support each other. And I want to um, continue that legacy and be uh, just a change within our community and to prove everyone that, you know, you can, um, you can start off at a community college and then end up in university and, you know, <laughs> carry on. I want to add That's a little wonderful. bit to that. Um, I, I would say um, if you guys do have the opportunity to do a tour, I know a lot of campuses, you, you, have, you have the ability to do an online tour, a live tour, and, you know, that's really good and definitely go, do that. But if you can meet in person, um, you'll, you'll really get a sense of the campus and you'll, you'll really feel it. And I think that's, where, that's when I knew that I felt at home. And specific to GCU, they have uh, Discover programs. And I'm not sure how much it's changed due to COVID, but in mm -hmm. previous years, there was so, there, um, there's groups of students coming to campus on a weekly basis. And a lot of times they get, um, they, they get it for free. They get, they get flown out from whatever other state they're in and they get the opportunity to stay in an actual college dorm for a weekend or a whole week. And they get to actually experience what it's like to be a college student at this campus. So if you're thinking about GCU, look into Discover. And if you're thinking about any other schools, definitely do your research and try to get the ability to actually see it in person. Yeah, that does make a big difference if you have the ability. I know it's been definitely a challenge this past year, but yeah, definitely a good thing. Thank you. Okay, and then for Alexis, uh, we have a question that says, what made you decide to go out of state for school and what has your experience been like being in a different state for college? Yeah, so this was a little bit of a big decision for me. Um, like Jennifer and Louise, I am pretty family oriented and attached to my family. So moving uh, a long ways away was definitely a big decision. Um, I guess it can come down to essentially two factors. So first, uh, my family decided that they were going to move and um, get an RV and start traveling. So there was no longer the immediate connection to Arizona. So that was a pretty big um, consideration. But second, I guess in terms of just experience experiences, um, I, knew, I had no clue where I wanted to live when I grew up. Um, I didn't know anywhere in the United States. I didn't even know if I was staying in the States. And so I thought that it would be the perfect opportunity as an undergraduate student who is not attached, doesn't have you know, a house or a family or any dependents, um, that this was the perfect opportunity to get the experience in, to just kind of get a trial run to where in the country I would enjoy being. Um, so that was definitely a factor. And then another piece of going out of state is um, I had a lot of friends who were going to in-state universities and, oh, sorry. Um, and they were able to maintain their community connections and that's definitely been advantageous for them. But by moving to a new, a new state in a university that has a lot of out-of-state students, um, we have, the University of Chicago has a pretty high, has a really low number of students who are from Illinois. Um, so it therefore has a lot of students who are not from Illinois. And so that was a new networking opportunity for students of an incredibly diverse backgrounds. Um, there are people on my floor from different countries. There, I, you know, made friends with people from all across the country. And so that is a national network that I do believe I will be able to leverage in the future, um, not only for a more successful, you know, future career opportunity, but definitely for a more diverse and expanded friend group. Thank you. Then it looks like we have a question for Jennifer that says, would you 
Would you say a community college is better for staying in state or about the same as university when it comes to moving to a new place after college? Yeah, and um, that's a really great question. And I would have to say that the answer will vary. Um, so it depends on the individual. If you want, if you know that you want to stay home and you want to attend your local community college, then definitely proceed with that decision. But if you want to explore and venture out and discover a new city, discover a new environment, meet other people, but you know that um, uni university is not affordable for you, then I would definitely look into doing um, community college elsewhere out of state. Um, one thing to consider while do making this decision is that if you do go out of state, you're definitely going to most typically get charged out of state tuition, but it, it also is significant less than if you were to do university out of state tuition. So I believe that the um, the answer to this question is that it would it, your financial aid would definitely determine what is best for you and what you should do. Um, but um, my biggest advice for that is to go with what you feel is right for you, uh, both your student um, life, learning style, and experience, uh, because you will um, know that it's the right decision for you and you won't regret it. Thank you. And so this next question, it's more general, so anyone can answer it, but Someone asked, there are so many colleges out there and I have no clue where to even start to begin or where to even start to begin to narrow down my search. What are some of your guys' recommendations for how to narrow it down and where to begin? So I guess for this one, um, I did apply to a lot of schools. Um, I think about 18 schools I applied to. Um, and that was a pretty high number, um, but I was able to narrow it down and I chose those schools. Um, I didn't really pay attention to rankings too much um, because they're super variable depending on who's making the rankings. And so that definitely, while it's a minute factor, it's not something that you should make your list off of. Um, I would say definitely the materials that they sent you um, are going to make a big difference. So every school has their own set of values. And, there, you know, there are a lot of buzzwords that a lot of schools send out, but you can essentially narrow it down if you read the materials to what it would actually be like um, at the university or college. And do they uphold that through their classes? Um, and then there's just a lot of factors. Um, and so start to sit down and ask yourself a couple questions. Do you want urban? Do you want suburban? Do you want a really big school or do you want a smaller school? What are your values? And then try and find the universities and colleges and community colleges that coincide with those values. Thank you. Yes, and to add to Alexa's um, comment is, um, I do wanna say <clears throat> is don't get overwhelmed. Um, take breaks, do little by little. What really is important is that you make your decision um, based on what your needs are. Um, one thing that I, um, did um, while I was making my decision is that I sat myself and said, okay, um, in four years, how, uh, what's going to be my financial plan? Or I also looked at the curriculum. So for me, I was going into education. I wanted to go to university that had the curriculum that I would be like, well prepared for my career. Look at their about the institution's values and integrity. Do they vocalize what you want to represent? Do they make um, everyone feel um, inclusive? Do they have the resources that you may need in the future? Are they supportive to your student learning? So if if that's with counseling, um, academic centers. So look into the things that you may need while you're there because that will make, will help you decide, okay, when I go and make that um, next uh, milestone in my life, I know that I'm going to be okay. And I know that there's resources out there for me and that institution will support me. I would also jump in and just say that, um, don't be afraid to just jump in and start getting a feel. A lot of times, um, you know, you don't, you don't know exactly what you want, right? And that's okay. Um, and, um, and 
you know, so, so right now it actually, you know, the pandemic for us, I mean, we're a national liberal arts and science college of 1800 students, right? And so, you know, when I go to Arizona for my week in October, if I don't see you in person, I'm not there again until maybe in the spring or that next October, right? And so now I can have, I can have Zoom sessions with people from Arizona all the time. They can come to our spotlight and just join us for a spotlight for 30 minutes and learn a little bit more about living on campus and what the residence hall situation is like or what it's like for, we had a town hall of students that were interested in law and society or pre-law and what that means at Allegheny, you know, because we don't have a, we don't have a law school, right? And so, okay, so what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, you know, and, and so we're doing all kinds of things, um, act, you know, virtually that it's actually, yes, there are drawbacks because you can't go to some student at some places in person, but it actually take advantage of everything virtually that you can do um, and really just ask questions. Um, we always say, any, I always say that um, when students are sophomores, juniors, I always say the best thing you can do is choose a few local places to go to that are urban and uh, urban and not urban, um, you know, uh, within driving distance and um, small and large, and just kind of get a feel for what it is. And now I would say do that virtually, you know, and just don't worry that if you don't have any questions to ask, just involve yourself, participate, let other people do the asking and just learn from it at first. Okay. Uh, I want to um, say how I did mine real quick. Um, mine was a little different. Like, like I said, I'm DACA. So to me, like, I don't have that many options. So what I did is, you know, what are my options? And to me, gr growing up, I had a lot of closed doors. But when there's a closed door, what do you do? You knock. So what I did, you know, when I was thinking, where do I start? Just start. I applied to all my community colleges in the area. I applied to then all the big universities in Arizona, I got a little ambitious, I implied out of state, and then I waited on responses, accepted, 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 out of state denied. Okay, my options are Arizona. And then I started looking at it, what do I want to do? Okay, I wanna get involved, I wanna network, I wanna meet people, and I wanna live on campus. So colleges are not an option. Okay, now I have all the big universities in Arizona, what do I wanna do? Do I wanna go to NAU? It's kinda cold, I don't know. Do I want to go to U of A? That's kind of far too. Do I want to stay in Phoenix? If I want to stay in Phoenix, there's GCU, there's ASU. And then it came down to finances, went to GCU. So it's just, you know, look at what your options are and don't overthink it because just applying, you don't lose anything. And even if there's an application fee, you can get a wave too. So you have nothing to lose. Just apply and then look at what your options are. And if I can go back to um, something Jennifer was talking about too before with out of state, um, out of state universities um, or state funded universities, you are totally correct that you will, you will pay a different um, tuition as an out of state student. But for any private college or university that you're looking at out of state, everyone pays the same. Every, I mean, I, I mean, the sticker price is the same for for everyone, right? There's not an in-state and out-of-state tuition, and um, just like you're not sure whether you're going to, you know, be admitted to, you know, your reach school, um, you're still applying. I would do that same thing with finances. Um, you know, it may end up being that you have to cross someone off your list um, in the end because of financial reasons, but don't eliminate them from the start make sure you go through the process. Thank you. Another question we have would be, how does your college show or promote diversity or what resources are there for students of color? Um, so for ASU, um, They've actually created just this year a new initiative where they have a committee for African Americans and their, um, their mission is to um, have more representation, not in just in the curriculum, but also in their faculty. Um, so they're employing way more um, 
faculty members that are diverse, diverse, sorry. Um, another perspective to this is that in teaching, which is I'm familiar with, um, there are um, a group of teachers are working together to create a curriculum for K-12 that is inclusive and embraces diversity. Um, another thing too is that um, for each, um, each moment that there was uh, like uh, a diversity um, event that was happening. So like, for example, uh, Black Lives Matter, um, President Crow um, would send out an email and that email, I'm not trying to be <laughs> um, biased because I'm ASU, but that email was really, um, you know, it was a page long and he, he addressed the concern and he took initiative and explained, this is what's happening. This is what we're going to do. And he was even open to, to ideas or suggestions. How can we help? How, what, what, what should we do? So it really created a community where not only was the issue being addressed, but it was being finally heard and it was being, being, being given a voice. Just jumping off that, so the University of Chicago has a very diverse population. Over 60% of students are people, are, are persons of color. Um, and the university has shown a pretty concentrated commitment to working with a community which has a predominantly African-American population. Um, and so the university has shown um, like through actions and initiatives as well as like through concentrated um, you know, communications to all the students, like Jennifer was saying, those large emails that go out, um, reaffirming the university's commitment to diversity in education and within their community. Um, and I've been incredibly impressed by the university's commitment to that and their values. Um, I also know that the university, like UChicago has the largest like voting initiative in the country out of any university. Um, and it really focuses on getting st uh, students and community members who were not previously involved in the civic education process involved and because of the racial population makeups of the community that is predominantly people of color. Um, and so I do know the university is committed not only in words but also in actions to supporting students and community members who identify as people of color. Thank you. At GCU, like I was speaking earlier on the different kinds of clubs, there's cultural clubs and I'm not too familiar with all the clubs. I know there's Filipino club, Hispanic club, and the list goes on. And there's also events. There, there was one event uh, called All Around the World. And it was um, an event where you could just show your, your, your pride and heritage and celebrate in um, the differences of all our nationalities. And it was really beautiful. Everybody was singing and there were so many different diverse crowds. Um, at GCU, I think the percent of diversity um, is 40%, 40, 60. Um, might have to check me, um, but there is a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of diversity, I mean. And there's also, there's also been a newly implemented um, multicultural director. So I've actually been invited to speak with him and he's super cool. And the thing about GCU, like, like I keep mentioning, is they have a lot of student opportunity and they actually listen to our voices. So if you do feel like you're not being included or you have a complaint, you can literally schedule a talk with, with uh, the head of the multicultural office and they'll talk to you and they'll hear you out and they'll, they'll take that into consideration and they'll actually you know, advocate on your behalf. So there's a lot of uh, diversity, I would say, at my school as well. Yes, at, at Allegheny, um, you know, very similar um, in the sense that, of course, you know, when I was when I was talking about um, just, you know, the smaller population of 1,800 students, but we actually have over the past 15 um, 15 years, um, 15 to 18 years, we've gone from five or six percent um, of our population um, being um, students of color um, or 
um, non-majority students to um, you know, close to 30%. And so it definitely has had an impact on um, you know, a lot of things here. Um, our culture and diversity clubs have, um, have really grown. Um, and we also find that um, majority students are oftentimes part of those, um, of those programs as well, or those, those um, organizations as well. Definitely we have an idea center, which it's, um, um, inclusion, diversity, equity, access, and social justice. Um, and um, they run a lot of the programming to do um, that, um, you know, um, for intentional initiatives to of, of diversity. Um, and then the affinity groups go through, go through them as well. We have Black Girl Magic, we have Chinese American um, Friendship Society, Gender and Sexuality Alliance, um, of course, International Club, which I indicated too. Um, we have Union Latinx, um, African um, Students Association, really, um, you know, many, many different ways. But we also have ways, um, you know, cultural academic areas too, communication and cultural studies class, um, you know, religious, um, different religious groups as well. Um, we have a Black Studies um, academic area as well, um, Caribbean Studies um, minors, and so um, women's gender and sexuality studies. And so students are really learning a lot about um, things as they're going through their regular coursework, um, and then also um, within, their, within their organizations. Um, definitely, we're a microcosm of society, right? And so um, it's not always easy. It's not always easy. Um, and, uh, and so what I've really liked is um, our administration embracing, um, you know, not being afraid of to talk about, um, to have a town hall meeting and talk about what issues there are and how we can improve them. Because really you. in the end, in the end, you're going to have you know, in the end, you're going to go off um, into your into your jobs and into society, and you really have to be able to um, learn from the diversity around you and understand how to work um, across difference. That's one of the key things that our career preparation people have said that employers are looking for is how have you demonstrated that you can work across difference, and so that is um, that's something really important to think about. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you guys. It looks like that's that's gonna have to be the conclusion to the Q&A portion of the event. I wanna give a thank you to everyone who asked questions and to all of the college representatives that gave amazing answers. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass uh, the mic on to Sohan who will go ahead and conclude this event for us today. Thank you guys. Hello everyone, I hope you can hear me. And so, of course, this event ran fantastically. First off, I would like to thank all of our speakers. You offered phenomenal advice. I learned so much about not only the resources that each of your colleges had, but also the culture that your college brought. And it's, I believe that it was very valuable to not only me, but also the audience and how your college was portrayed. So I'd like to thank you personally for that. Suhani, Abigail, Tate, you did absolutely fantastic in your planning. All your hard work paid off. And thank you to the audience for attending and making this possible. So without further ado, this webinar series is adjourned.